And I want to ask, so we talked uh, earlier about the emergence of the word creator, and which has gotten a whole bunch of momentum around the creator economy. And I'm sort of curious, and again, you're right at the thick of this, why do we need the word creator as opposed to the word we initially had, which was influencer? What's the difference and what are the implications of the difference in terms? So this, I'm gonna, I'll give an answer. It's going to be a subjective answer, folks. You may disagree with me or you may want to refine what I say. And to that, I welcome your opinion. Welcome back to Generation Influence, a podcast focusing on the movers and shakers working behind the scenes in influencer marketing, social, and e-commerce. Today's guest is Daryl Prale, who is the CMO of Agorapulse, a leading social media marketing platform. I love this bio so much. I want to read the whole damn thing. Daryl Prell is the Chief Marketing Officer of Agorapulse, the award-winning social media management platform. Daryl is a funny, high-energy, in-demand event host and panel moderator, speaker, and multi-time gold medalist content creator, a top 10 SaaS branding expert, a top 19 B2B marketer to watch, voted by LinkedIn as a top three marketer, which by the way, I totally believe, and a top 30 sales leader, a social media influencer, a category leading podcaster, and a serial entrepreneur. Daryl has raised almost 100 million in venture capital, acquired, merged, and taken companies public, been hired and fired, look at that for true honesty, and worked with companies of all sizes. Daryl, with a bio like that, it's no surprise you have an enormous following on LinkedIn and a unique perspective on social media marketing. Welcome to the show. Tell us some of the key moments that got us to where you are and how you ended up as the CMO of Agora Pulse. Oh my goodness, Bill. You're, you're far too generous. Um, I don't know if I would believe half of that bio. It is all true, but it's just obnoxious. You know what I'm saying? But like every good marketer, you got to package yourself because you don't know when that next recruiter is going to come knocking on your door, which is funny. It's true. That's how much I got this job. A recruiter saw me speaking on stage in London, England, where I am not located. I'm based out of Canada. And they said, hey, have we got a job for you? So there you go, folks. I went to school to be a, 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 a programmer, a systems developer. And, I, and you know, when I finished Whoa. three years of university, I said, I'm tired of computers. I don't want to do that anymore. So what do you do when you don't know what to do? You obviously go into sales, right? Not marketing, sales. So of course I'm in sales and I sold photocopiers for six months. And Bill, let me tell you, I sucked at it. I was horrible. I would walk up and down these industrial strip malls with my backpack of photocopiers, walking into some greasy mechanic or some overworked accountant and try to sell them this incredible photocopier. It was, it was, it was a lesson Less a life lesson in how to handle rejection and overcome objection. Uh, 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 just, you know, people don't like you. And I said, after six months, you know what? Maybe I don't miss coding so much. And I went back and I coded for, I don't know, six years. But along the way, I still had the itch to go beyond coding. And coding led to a chance to be a sales engineer because I had the sales background of six months. And then sales engineer went to product management, for product management, they went to product marketing, for product marketing, went to marketing. It was just a natural uh, transition. And then I went back and forth over the years as being a, a ultimately a, you know, a VP of sales or a VP of marketing or a chief sales officer, or chief revenue officer, most recently, and a CMO. And I love all the revenue games, but I prefer a CMO versus a CRO because I don't have responsibility of that monthly, quarterly, annual nut to hit on the sales quota. It sucks. Sucks That's the life out of you. Sales it's quota. stressful. I agree. You know, you go from zero to zero from the last day of the quarter to the next day of the next quarter. It's like you're, you were, we loved you yesterday, but you suck now. So <laughs> I was just a guy who was techie, who happened to be the right place at the right time. And honest to God, people talk about all the changes going on these days. People talk about AI and it's going to take your jobs away and everything else is going on and it's scary. And oh my God, the sky is falling. I will tell you this, folks. I started marketing before the internet. And yes, you know, it's been around for forever. But commercially, I was in marketing in 93, 94. And the internet didn't really kind of kind of kind of kick into 95, 96 in its very yep. earliest days. 
And, uh, and it was a different world marketing then, let me tell you. And if I can go through transitions of from no internet to internet to dot-com crash to the financial you know, collapse of 2007, 2008 to this latest incarnation, if I can go through you know, pre-SaaS world to a post-SaaS world, if I can go into no marketing automation to art marketing automation, AI, just another tool, folks. So there you go. It's a good time. It's a fun time. It's an interesting time. And I'm delighted to be at Agora Pulse. I took the job at Agora Pulse specifically because it was in social media. I could see a tough economy coming down the road. Nobody gets rid of social media, number one, just like they don't get rid of, rid of their CRM. They don't get rid of their accounting package. They don't get rid of social media. And number two, it is the number one channel for every single marketer out there. You may not think about it, but everything you're doing, you're trying to do that ebook, you're trying to do awareness, you're trying to get people to your webinar, you're trying to get people to listen to a podcast, you're trying to get people to try your free trial. The most affordable, the most uh, reaching channel you have, which is great. You notice I said they're affordable, which means I have no budget, um, <laughs> is social media. It's, it, it, it's the great uh, unifier because whether you're rich or you're poor, you're funded or you're not, social, the cost of entry is negligible. And you can have a huge impact. And that's where I wanted to be. So that's why I'm here. Well, first of all, I want to say among many firsts, I think we're going to have on this uh, edition of the podcast. I don't know that I've ever met someone who is in sales and coding. I think I might think that those are two of the most diametrically opposed they are. professions in the world, which means that you are, in fact, a true Renaissance man. So I just want to acknowledge that. I, I literally am racking my brain. I don't think I've ever met any. I mean, I'm sure it exists. But, but you know, I, I can say, tell that you is a, the unicorn. common thread. The common thread there, if you listen, folks, carefully, the common thread is structure and logic. Hear me out. All right. Sales done properly is structured. There mm -hmm. is intentionality. You know, whether it's a sales sequence, it's how you structure your emails, how you structure your social media outreach, it's how you structure your call, whether you want to provoke engagement within the first seven seconds of that live conversation, how you respond to an objection, it's all a thousand percent structured. So when you start thinking sales is just that guy who's out there and he's just got the personality and charm for it, I say, nay, nay, it's structured. It's totally structured, just like coding. That's the commonality. Wow. It's amazing. Uh, another guest on the show, Tiffany Begay of uh, Church and Dwight. Her the main lesson she took away from her mentor. So this is her number one career lesson of all time was how you react to the no and actually getting the no so that you can get to the yes. So I love these, you know, ripples and riffs um, in people's thinking. The, the other thing, by the way, I love you said that, that you said that changing my thinking already is, is social's not going away. You know, I'm, I don't know if this means I'm just young enough, but, or maybe, no, actually, I think it means I'm really old, which is a known fact. But anyway, <laughs> I still, I, you know, I'm in social too, obviously. And I still have that existential threat that what if this is all a fad? I mean, I, intellectually, I know it's not, but but there's that emotional part that's like, well, what if everyone wakes up tomorrow and decides that, you know, the emperor has no clothes, meaning social. And, you know, I love the confidence you have that like, so, and you're right. I mean, it's just almost self-evidently obvious when you say it, but here I am a guy who's worked in it for 10 years and just afraid that like, geez, what if, you know, what if, it, what, what if this goes away? And you're like, no, 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 lean into it. So let, let me right. give you an example on that, Bill, just, yep. just to, to get people thinking, okay? Many of your audience will not understand what I'm about to say, at least the first part. They'll catch up halfway through. But people like you and I, we're going to 100% get it, all right? So is social going away or not? When I was coding, I was busy being on bulletin boards, BBSs. And then I evolved into CompuServe. And then I evolved into ICQ and AOL. And then I got into MSN and then I got into MySpace and then I got into, you know, Google and Facebook. All right. And, and you see where we're going with this, right? The platform may change, but the construct will not. I totally agree. It's actually, I love that. One of, one of my favorite things to talk to younger employees about who have not seen 
these cycles is, you know, the moment that you think a Google, an Amazon, an Apple, a Facebook are going to control the world and are immediate, you know, in just completely unstoppable is five minutes before something goes horrendously wrong and somebody else rises up and takes that place. And so the, the only thing truly in tech that we know for sure is that it will change and, you know, and there will be a new unstoppable single force, you know, on the planet. Um, and so there's definitely been a concentration of power, but like none of these folks are, uh, you know, are permanent. None of these structures are permanent, but for sure, the, the concept of the, or the, the overall direction for all of us and for, you know, for, for what it means about how we interact is unstoppable. So amen. Um, all right. Well, with that, I feel like we need to learn a little bit more about Agora Pulse and what's the company's unique perspective in social and what kind of companies are in the client base and who, who are you guys serving? Awesome question. Thank you so much, folks. This is the this is when the host gives the guest a chance to have a brief infomercial. So if you want to skip forward 30 seconds, you're welcome to do that. But it's going to be worth your while. Just stay tuned. I'll keep it short. Uh, Agora Pulse is a social media management platform. So candidly, as a marketer or as a social seller, if you're in sales, for example, or maybe you're a content creator, or maybe you're an influencer, there's two different ways you can approach social media. One is you go native. I'm going to have Twitter open in a browser. I'm going to have LinkedIn open in another browser. I'm going to have Instagram open on my phone. I'm going to have Facebook open in another browser and so on and, so, and YouTube and everything else. You got it's like, oh my God, but I can go native, but they're open everywhere. It's hard to scale if you want to reach your audiences. So how do you scale? The easiest way is use a social media uh, management platform, which is one tool like Agora Pulse that allows you to post across in one fell swoop to all those different platforms embracing the nuances. Is it 140 characters? Is it 280 characters? Is it unlimited characters? Doesn't really matter. With all the graphics and all the features, videos, reels, whatever you want to do, and just let it go in just a one tool. And then that same one tool listens to all of them, looks for keywords or phrases, or anytime there's a comment, it goes into your centralized inbox so you can be responsive in real time, which of course grows your reach because that's how the algorithms work. Yada, yada, yada. It's one tool to manage all your social media. That's what Agora Pulse does. And for anybody I just uh, who, who works in social media, just think about that from an efficiency point of view and, uh, and just your time. How much is your time worth, right? So that's the first part. <sighs> Second part of what we do that's really cool, it's unique to us, is we have this construct. Uh, it's new. It's about a year old. We launched it called Social Media ROI. And... Uh, Bill, I'll, I'll use an example. This I love this example because most people who've been in marketing for a year or two or 10 get it. You know, 20 years ago, when I was reporting on my websites, I would say we had a million visitors this month, folks. That's right, a million visitors. Isn't that amazing? We rock. And everybody would nod their head and say yes. 15 years ago, when I'd say we had a million visitors in our site, everybody would look at me and they would say, so what? What changed? What changed in those five years? What changed was because they started realizing, well, visitors are interesting. What matters is how many of those visitors convert to sales, convert to money, drive revenue. So if a million visitors are coming and no one's buying, the other website's got 100 people coming and 50 of them are buying, give me the website, please, with 100 visitors, not a million visitors. You know what I'm saying? So in other words, it's about return on your investment. So today what happens in the similar paradigm is social media marketers forever have tried to validate their existence. Every social media marketer out there, a couple of attributes they all share. We've done studies on this, Bill. I'm not making this up. So most social media marketers do not feel valued on the team. This is statistically like an 80 plus percentile. It's crazy. Um, they do not feel like they're consulted for their input and they do not feel like they're respected, and they do not feel like they have a career path. Why is that? Because of a couple of reasons. Number one, too many marketing leaders have no clue how social media works. They just ignore it. Kind of like pay-per-click. If I don't understand pay-per-click, I hire an agency, I give them some money, and I say, produce good results for me. And as long as you produce good results for me, I'll keep you on staff, on, on retainer. I don't need to understand it. That's your job. I just need to make sure that you're driving results so I can keep my job. 
Social media is the same way. They don't understand social media. They don't understand following. They don't understand engagement. They don't understand like, algorithms. So they give some 25-year-old in the back room who's got their first job at a school, you know, $50,000 a year and some pizzas, and they say, just make sure nobody's complaining about us. There's no PR disasters happening. Don't violate any of our policies. You know, don't make us look bad. In fact, don't take any risks at all. In fact, just post our press releases and that's it, please. That's what they say. So as you can see, the social media person, A, is not respected. B, is not given responsibility. C, is not asked to practice their craft and really get creative and grow with it. But D, how they measure everything those leaders of those companies do is by ROI. What have you done? Pay per click, I can see the ROI. I got 100 clicks. Uh, that led to 10 deals. That led to three proposals. That led to one sale. Boom, there's the ROI. I can measure that. They can't measure social media. What ends up happening is they say, well, subjectively speaking, when I get 300 likes and follows on this post, that usually results in one sale. Therefore, I'm making my my I'm paying my salary. But they can't prove it. And what happens is the CFO says, bullshit. Until I see hard data, it's just a lot of fuddy-duddy. ROI, social media ROI, what we do is the first engine that physically will go and take anything you're doing, whether it's on paid social or organic social, and it will track it and say, you know that comment you made in that LinkedIn post three months ago? Because of that comment, you drove a new sale. And now the social media people can actually prove the impact, not make a subjective declaration, not do, well, I kind of sort of, well, hypothetically, well, if we use some assumptions. No, they can prove it. They can do CFO speak. They can say, here's the data. Here's the thread. This is exactly how it happened. Here's the attribution. All because I made a comment on a LinkedIn post that was social. It's organic, no, no less. Now, suddenly, because of that, all the social media people are going, oh, my existence is real. I can prove the impact I'm having. Because they can prove it, they get the attention of all the leaders. And now all the leaders go back to them and they say, oh, my God, what were we doing ignoring you? You are strategic. We want you here at the table with us. And my friend, that is what Agorapulse does. That is how we're different. And that is how it's changing. That was a long-winded answer. I apologize. I have to work on my brevity. This has evolved out of a blog series I ran called The Math and Science of Influencer Marketing. And so the idea of tracking ROI, not being afraid of the math, leaning into the math, you know, is is, is a great theme. And, and so I love that. I'm curious, though... Right. Because there actually is sort of this alignment between the social media manager who wants to be validated, um, the CMO who wants to see ROI. But what we found, and again, because Gen Video also is kind of celebrates analytics, we do things very different, but there's definitely echoes that I heard there, very familiar. There can be a lot of people along the way in the decision path who resist that because they're afraid that the analytics are going to show that it's not working. That really what they are getting is just a bunch of likes and, and visitors and want to be celebrated just for that. So either the math will be bad or the, or they won't understand the math. So I'm sort of curious for you guys, is it a push from the CMOs? If we're going to keep doing this, we're going to measure it. Or is it a pull from the social media managers? Like I'm tired of being underappreciated. Where, where did you guys, or where do you find your success in the sales cycle? Okay, so I'll give you kind of a, a before we launched it or in the early days of when we launched it and where it is now. Because the, the question to your answer, I'm the question to your answer, the answer to your question, edit that baby out. The answer to your question <laughs> has evolved. When we launched a year ago, every, almost every single agency said to us, so imagine a social media agency, right? They have lots of clients. This is what they do. Uh, you would be approached them and say, hey, wouldn't this be great? You can measure this. And almost every single agency said, I don't want to measure that. I don't want to, sh to, to be held accountable for driving revenue. I'm all about awareness. I'm not about revenue. And what it really came down to was they were nervous as hell of what if what they were doing wasn't driving revenue. Then all of a sudden they would see all their accounts walk away. The retainers would disappear. They actually vehemently resisted the concept of ROI, did not want to talk about it. I would then go to them and I'd say, but well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Miss agency owner, look at what you can do with this. Now you can go and prove the impact because you have confidence you're making a difference, right? Miss agency owner. So now you can prove it. And because they're going to see it, you can actually increase your retainer and upsell because now you have proof that you're making a, you're driving their revenue. Or better yet, you can prove it and you can reduce your churn. 
with your clients. Wouldn't that be crazy, right? So the lifetime value goes up dramatically, all because of ROI. And that started to crack the code a little bit, but they were still skeptical. So we saw that reaction. More recently, I won't name individuals, but I will name companies. I will call out both Gartner and Forrester. In briefings with them, one of them said, there's no way you can measure organic social. It is impossible. <laughs> and the other person said, social media is only for comms and PR and nothing else. It's not for driving revenue. I'm not making this up. And so we had fights, literal physical fights. The hand to fist to cuffs would have happened if we were there in person. Um, but it was a good conversation. And, and you could see by the end of the call, they were going, huh, never thought of it that way. And we continue to like each other and we continue to work together. So there was a lot of resistance. Now what's happening, and this is an anecdotal conversation I got from my sales reps about a month ago. They're saying it's amazing what a difference a year makes because we've been evangelizing. We work with a lot of different partners and influencers to get the message out there, making a lot of case studies, sharing the news. And they're saying now when we talk to whether it's CMOs or to social media people, they don't say, what do you mean ROI? They actually say, yes, you're right. We need to prove it. And what you're seeing is two things. You're seeing with the reduced economy, the CMOs are demanding ROI. If they're going to spend, because what's happening, a couple of things are happening. One, there's layoffs. Two, uh, there's a massive pressure to reduce the cost of their tech stack. So the CMOs are saying, I can keep the tech for which I can show an ROI. And maybe if I can show an ROI, I can keep that employee too that they were pushing me to get rid of because it's a headcount. So the CMOs are pushing it because they're realizing it's a means to an end. Plus, because their budgets got cut, their, their programs been got cut, they recognize social media is a channel and I need to treat it like that. The same way I treat pay-per-click as a channel and I would measure that and I would invest in it and I would fund it. So the, the, they're doing that way. What you're seeing on the other side is we're seeing the technicians are similarly doing it because now they're seeing and their peers are talking about their experiences. Well, when they do this, how it just changes how people perceive them internally. So now as part of their due diligence, when they're evaluating which vendors they want to look at, you're seeing that as part of the decision-making criteria. And we know we're having an effect now because if I look at other players in the space like Hootsuite and Sprout Social, they've launched eBooks and white papers in the last three months, all about ROI, which they never talked about before. And by the way, if you look at it, every marketer loves this. If you read the eBooks, they're really well done. Like hats off, they spend a lot of money. They got analysts involved. It's great. They, spark, they drop serious coin. What they do is they tell you e uh, measuring ROI is, is done by the merchant or done by Google Analytics. It is not done by the social platform. But don't worry, we integrate with them, so therefore you're cool. In other words, they don't do it. One year has changed dramatically, but that's the evolution that we've gone through, Bill, and it's been crazy. It's been crazy having to actually convince people that they want to measure ROI. But change is hard. Change is hard. Well, I love that you... you you laid out the question under the question uh, for me, which was great, which again, we've seen that same resistance for years to, you know, the more numbers you put out there, the more concerning it is. Do you feel like you've cracked the code? You know, okay, so now here are the numbers. Are you still in a situation where you need to contextualize that data and help people to understand what they're seeing? Or do you feel like we've gotten to a point that, you know, when you're helping that people are able to understand what success looks like on their own. Because again, first of all, we found two hurdles, the natural resistance just to having any data because it might be bad. But then even when they have the data, it's like, yeah, but I don't get this data. <laughs> Where are you on that second issue? It's, it's, it's the latter. It's the either I, I don't get this data or I'll rephrase it a little bit. I don't know how or what to measure. And so, for example, I'll have a conversation with so many social media people. Now, if you're a veteran marketer, I'm going to use a three letter acronym. You ready? Here it comes U T M. <laughs> All right. U T M. If you don't know what that is, go look it up, folks. For those yep. of you who do know what it is, of course, those are the parameters on the end of a, of a website address, you know, campaign medium source that allow you to track and attribute that link. So, if someone clicks on it, you can say, oh, that came from a Facebook ad. Uh, where we promoted this product, uh, specifically this, this campaign that we did on Facebook. Most social media people do not know what UTMs are. And that mm -hmm. blew my mind when I joined Agora Pulse. I actually thought people were pulling my leg, pulling the new guy's leg. And, but it's, it's actually true. Most 
social media people do not know what UTMs are. The second thing is most marketers, but especially social media marketers do not know typical financial metrics. And I've been doing a lot of education with a lot of the technicians saying, listen, this is how your CMO has to, how, this is how you, they pay your salary. They have to go back to the CFO and they have to show ROI, return on investment. That means they've got money. So they have to show that I'm bringing in more money than I'm, I'm costing you. And they measure that in things like MRR, monthly recurring revenue, ARR, you know, annual rec recurring revenue. Uh, they do things on net RR, so the net recurring revenue. They do things like on lifetime value. None of these acronyms, I could go on. None of these acronyms do they understand, do they know? So I have to teach them, if you want to measure ROI, you need to know the metrics that your CMO is going back and forth on with your CFO. If you can speak those metrics, you are golden. And to do that, you need the UTMs, which is how we track things. So there's a lot of education going on with this marketing group so that they can earn the respect. So it's not just a matter of having the tool. It's a matter of teaching them marketing and sales finance 101, which by the way, it's not their fault. I want to be clear in this. This is the fault of the schools and the fault of the revenue leaders. This should be, this should be part of your standard onboarding process, folks, where they teach you the basics of how we do some basic finance and how we fund your position and determine whether you get that end of the year bonus or not. I love it. I mean, I, I love that you guys are out there evangelizing all of these metrics because yes, this is not going away. It's only going to get more sophisticated. Um, and, you know, and, and, and under, if you don't understand these games, somebody else is going to understand them and they're going to beat you every time. So yeah, hundred percent aligned. That was awesome. Let's change tax a little bit. And I want to go a little bit meta also for a second. And I want to ask, so we talked uh, earlier about the emergence of the word creator, and which has gotten a whole bunch of momentum around the creator economy. And I'm sort of curious, and again, you're right at the thick of this. Why do we need the word creator as opposed to the word we initially had, which was influencer? What's the Ooh. difference and what are the implications of the difference in terms? So the, I'm gonna, I'll give an answer. It's going to be a subjective answer, folks. You may disagree with me or you may want to refine what I say. And to that, I welcome your opinion. So please don't be shy. Um, DarylPrail.com or go to LinkedIn. Right? You're all set. Okay. Influ when we think of influencer. We think of, you know, the, I'm being uh, stereotypical. We think of the Cardassians. We think, you know, as an example, right? So if one of the Cardassians, I don't know their names, but if one of them puts on a certain, you know, shirt and they just wear it and their photographs seeing it, you know, they're being paid by your impressions or reach or what have you to wear that, that piece of apparel because it's going to sell out overnight in whatever, you know, fashion outlet that piece of clothing is sold in. That's an influencer. They influence people's perceptions around uh, what to wear, what to think. Creator, a little different. Creator says you do not necessarily need to have the fame, fortune, and notoriety of a Cardassian. Creator says you're physically creating killer content. Notice a Cardassian isn't necessarily making any content when they're wearing that cool shirt. They just appeared in an image. The creator is actually making killer content like what we're on right now. Bill is a creator. He's creating content. He's creating conversations. He's creating debate. And from the, those who consume Bill's creations, they're getting a little bit smarter. They're pulling the nuggets of information they need. And then they're physically uh, applying it to their own use cases. Now, but because they like Bill's content, because he's a creator, they grow to have an affinity with Bill. I may not have any affinity with the Cardassians because of that cool shirt they're wearing, but I have an affinity with Bill. He's got a great tone. He looks fun. He's got a great sense of humor. I could go for beers with Bill. So therefore, when I need a solution like what Bill offers, I'm going to think of Bill and his company. And I'm going to say, they got to be in the short list. All right. And by the way, if I have a colleague or a peer who's looking for a solution that Bill just talked about, I'm going to refer Bill's uh, content. I'm not going to refer anybody to that picture I just saw of the Cardassians. The one is an influencer. The one is creator. One is just influencing opinion on a personal basis. Creation, creators are actually making content that are affecting people's lives. And the beauty of the creator is that, as I said, you don't need to be a you know, massive following. 
you can have micro creators, you can have you know, mega macro creators, etc. If you know your niche, then you're there. And by the way, you don't need to be number one, number two, number three. Go on YouTube or TikTok. How many thousands upon thousands of people are making a living? And you know what they're on average doing? One video a week mm. on average. One. And they're getting enough advertising or affiliate revenue or their own merchandise to physically not only survive, but make a good living. That's what a creator is. It is a great equalizer and it is the next evolution. That's why we can go from being corporate employees to being the gig economy. I, Cause I can actually be a creator and that's my gig. And I can have multiple gigs. I can be multiple creators. I can have a job and be a gig on the side. We see that all the time. Anyway, how did I do, Bill? Did I get close? Did I not get close? I didn't see you I, scowl. No, I'm not scowling at all. I love it. I, it's given me a great framework to keep those two things. They can overlap. Absolutely. But they, but I've got great, uh, great structure now and framework to put them in their own buckets and appreciate each bucket for its own unique attributes. And actually, let's talk about you specifically because through the definition, it's almost like you probably consider yourself a creator where I also have you very much in the influencer bucket. I mean, you have 18,000 followers on LinkedIn. Now, if that was Instagram, that that might not be blowing anybody's mind away. But 18,000 followers on LinkedIn is world-class, top three marketer on LinkedIn, I think we heard earlier in the podcast. And so first, I want to ask, are there any superpowers that come with having that many followers? Like, if you just want to drop something out there in the ether, does it just automatically send huge ripple effects? Are there other powers that might come just from having that? Or what is, what is, what, what's it like to have 18,000 <laughs> followers like, on LinkedIn? I mean, 18, I mean, we're, we're, we're getting close to, to 19 now. My goal is to be 20 in a couple months. Um, I've never worked at it until very recently. And when I, but folks, when I mean worked at it, I mean, only in the last three months, four months, have I physically started saying, okay, I'm allowed to do like a hundred invitation requests a week or whatever it is. I'm going to identify target people that I want to be connected with, who I think add value to my tribe. And I'm going to reach out and proactively invite mm -hmm. them before them. Everything you've seen developed there was hundred percent organic. Um, are there magic powers to come with it? And, you know, yes and no. I mean, yes, I can put something out there. And it gets picked up and I get more like when I'm at the trade shows and the notor uh, or whatnot, I get a lot of notoriety that way. My sales reps love me because they'll get a lot of inbound activity. They'll say, yeah, I saw Daryl's posts or I saw this and because of him, uh, I'm doing this. Uh, so there's that. It is a little creepy at times. I've had many, many shows I've gone to where I've had people uh, whisper and point at me from afar, too scared to come and say hi, which I don't get. I'm just a, mid fifties guy who's boring as hell folks. Trust me. Uh, I'm really harmless. Come say hi. And, and, and they want to know my secret. They never seem to like the answer for some reason, because how did I get here? I just got here just through several years of creating consistent, well, mostly consistent, like everybody else here. There are times when I'm just overwhelmed and underwater and I can't get stuff out there, but uh, creating great content. Um, and candidly, if I can give you a, a piece of, of, of advice, uh, one is there's almost more engagement in the comments and not necessarily in your post, but in somebody else's mm -hmm. posts. If you, too many of you are just doing things like, oh, love your posts. Great job. Way to go. Killer. Way to go. Preach, brother. And that's your comment. And you know what? A guy like me comes along and sees the original post. And I'll say, you know what? I really like what you're saying about A and B, but I disagree with you on C in your post. And this is why I disagree. Blah, blah, blah. You know what happens every time I do that? The poster who often could be, could be a Cardassian, some of the way more influenced than me, responds to my comment. And they'll say something, hey, Daryl, I, I really, I, I respect that you differ with me on C. Let's talk about that. And all of a sudden what you have is you have a, you have a whole thread within the post and the thread is getting more eyeballs than the original mm -hmm. post. And then what happens is everybody goes, who the hell is this guy that that big ass Cardassian influencer is giving the time of day to? He must be smart. And then they follow me. And no, I'm not smart, but I, it, it, optics are deceiving, right? Um, so it's, 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 it's the comments, it's the great content, it's consistency, having a take, 
too many people are afraid to have a take because of, for a variety of reasons. I don't like conflict. I don't want to be trolled. By the way, I get all that. And guess what? You can block those people. Um, so it's, it truly comes down to you know, having a take. You know, For me, once you figure out who you are and what your take is, I'm good at sales and marketing. I'm not going to come to you and tell you how to repair a car. But in sales and marketing, I've got a lot of experience. So that's what I'm going to stick to. For me, I'm going to stick to talking more to the senior marketers, a CMO, a VP of marketing, a director level marketing, than I am a marketing specialist who's just entered the, the space. So that's my niche. That's where I'm going. For me, it's B2B, not B2C. I can do B2C, but really that's my, that's, that's my knitting. Once you know your space, you'd be shocked how narrow and small that community is, and you can build a brand pretty damn fast. The other thing is, mm-hmm. sounds stupid, is not just consistency of content, but consistency of look and feel. Because I understand most content's being consumed on a phone and they're, they're, they're going up and down their timeline very quickly. So what do I have? What have I developed that gets them to stop momentarily on their feed and dwell a little bit? What I've got sounds stupid is I have spiky white hair and I have white beard and that's, that's groomed and I have thick blue glasses. This is a persona, this is an avatar. So when they see my talking head, they've seen my content before, they stop and they're like, what's Daryl talking about now? He's always good for a laugh or to piss me off, one of the two, but either way, I'm gonna stop and consume his content. So having that consistency of recognition, it sounds stupid, those are the trademarks. And then tell a story. When you're in there, be personal, let your personality come through. People love people who are quirky or funny or self-deprecating, because we're all just people. People buy from people. So if you just take the pressure off yourself and be yourself, you're kind of an interesting person, believe it or not. And it's not as hard as you might think. It just takes a little bit of commitment. But those are the superpowers. That's how I got there. And those are my lessons learned. You didn't ask for all three, but I, I gave them to you, Bill. Just yeah. I appreciate it. It's free. I got three for the price of one. There you um, go. And I, I want to double click in on the, the comment about consistency because I, I think I just connected some dots and I want to confirm if I did or not. Um, so for the, the two regular viewers, hi mom of this <laughs> podcast, um, they will recognize that, uh, this is one of the first recordings we've done with a new setup. We've got a new mic. Thank you. HyperX. We've got a new camera. Thanks HP. We've got some lights shining on my face. Although it doesn't always work when the sun really wants to do its thing. It's, it's, you can't stop nature. That was, that's my lesson. But anyway, uh, so we've upgraded the rig. And, you know, for the first 10 episodes or so, you know, the, the rig was, was, was pretty much off the rack, um, which wasn't something that I was focused on. You know, I was like, well, it'll be the content, the quality of the conversations that matter, not the video production. But when I asked you about growth uh, earlier and how you got to 18,000 and like, what was the seed? Another thing you talked about was you did really high production quality podcasts early, early in the, in the wave of podcasting. I thought that was such a, what made him think that production quality was going to be the thing that stood out. And so again, when you talk about sort of that consistency in the avatar, I don't know, are those two things connected or what was the thesis there around production quality will make me different? It's a really Brilliant question. So I had my own agency for 10 years. And when I had the agency, I remember talking to my clients and trying to get them to spend money, for example, on their website, on their website, simple, something as simple as that. And, and I would often, oh, we have a website. It's fine. I don't need to spend money there because they're not marketers. Maybe they're accountants or lawyers or whatever they were. And I would say, okay, let me ask you a question. I said, hypothetical, but I, want, I need you to answer honestly. And they said, sure, what is it? I said, you're going to go buy a pair of shoes online. Okay, so we're going to go buy a pair of shoes. Are you with me? Yeah, I'm with you. I'm going to buy a pair of shoes. Great, okay. You found the shoes you'd like at two different websites. Yep, two different websites. Um, I said, they're the same price on both sites. They can both be delivered in the exact same time frame. Which site do you buy from? And you see them hum and ha, and they go, I don't know. I said, let me give you a clue. If one site looked like it came from 1995 and one site looked like it came from 2020, would that influence your decision? Well, yeah, I'd probably buy the site from 2020. Why? And they would say, I, I, don't, kn- I, I, I don't know. 
And I said, I'll, I'll tell you why. Because if it looks current, looks polished, looks credible, it feels like it's less risky. Mm. It feels like it's more trustworthy. It feels like you will, you have confidence in their operations. Is that a fair statement? And they would go back and they would go, hey, yeah, actually, you know, now you put it that way. Yeah, that's, that's actually it. I say, yeah, welcome to Human Behavior 101. The whole point of marketers is to overcome risk and build trust. And how do we do that? We do that because people are making an instant decision on whether I like you or I dislike you because we're conditioned to do that over and over and over again all day long. So how can you tip the scales to make sure people think you're credible, think you're trustworthy, you're not a risk? Sounds stupid, but if I look better on camera, if I sound better in the audio than my competition does, even though we're doing the exact same thing, I'm going to get the business because we're, we're all humans. And that's where the premise came from. Got it. I, it rings so true. It's so ironic. You know, for years being in video influencer marketing behind the camera, not in front of the camera, I have just stressed over and over all the subconscious signaling that's going on. Yes. And here I missed the application. It's, 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 it's truly embarrassing. The application of my own rules to my own situation. So again, but it's not like human get nature, back right? Behind the we, camera. We, we also have our own concerns about costs and money and time and technology. I don't understand the technology. What do I do? I understand this change. Change is scary. You see a recurring theme here. The number one question I get over and over and over again for people who have outreached to me is, you know, number two might be, Hey, how did you get to where you were? And what can I learn from you? And can we get together for a coffee? But the number one question is, what gear are you using, Daryl? You look fantastic. <laughs> Followed by, and you're not a pretty man, so it must be good. So there you go. <laughs> there you go. Well, um, that is definitely true of me. I, I did want to ask, so again, you've got these thousands of followers on LinkedIn. So you're having these comments. You're engaging, you know, conversations. And you're engaging in the comments. Is there anything that you've been able to take from that experience that here I am participating, frankly, you know, at a, I'm going to call it a professional level, if we want to call it that, in the world of networking and interacting brought with, you know, again, thousands of people. Is there anything, any of your sensor, senses that have been heightened so much from that experience that you've been able to bring it back into your corporate life and apply it there. Any lessons from, again, from being out on LinkedIn, you now say like, ah, I recognize this dynamic internally in my corporate life and I'm able to apply it to make better decisions, either again, in interactions or maybe in executing the things that you need to do to be, you know, to be successful selling the software or whatever else. Indirectly, indirectly, um, but this. So I'll give you the. I'll give you an example. It is an indirect example, but actually, it's a really powerful example. And I've talked to other creators, and they have shared the same realization that I'm about to share with you, which is this: You see creators out there, like Bill. Bill again. We go back to Bill. Bill's a creator, but Bill's interviewing me. So Bill interviews me, and you know, a hundred other people over the course of a year. Who knows, right? Bill started off really smart. That's how he got here. It's how he's had a success. But then he's interviewed a hundred of us. And like Bill said, well, I, I, he's already shared with you. Daryl, I learned this and this from you. Now he's going to go do the exact same thing with a hundred other people. What do you learn this and this from? That cannot help but dramatically influence Bill's ability or in this case, because the question was asked of me, my ability to do my job. So for example, when, you know, I was a good sales leader, I will say good. I'm not trying to say great. But then I had a podcast for a 250 odd episodes where I interviewed like all the brilliant minds in the world. And I, you know what I did? I asked them all the questions that I personally needed help with or was struggling with under the guise of I'm making content for my audience. And then I would take all their answers and go back and apply it to my job. And damn it, nine times, out of, nine times out of 10, they were right. And people would look at me and they would say, how did you know all this? How are you so smart? Here's a raise. 
And I would smile and say, oh, you know, I'm Canadian. And of course, that was it. The fact of the matter is, because I was making content with quality people, not only were they educating my audience, they were educating me, and that made me better. So if I never made a piece of content, could I do the exact same thing? Yes, I could. If I went and read 100 of their books, or I listened to all of their podcasts, I could do the exact same thing. So you don't need to be a creator to get the benefit I'm talking about, but you do need to consume content. So either you create content or you consume content, but the end result is you're learning and you can apply that to your own professional skill set. And that has made a dramatic difference for my success. I buy that totally. I am, uh, maybe this will sound arrogant, but it's meant to sound very humble. I am amazed at the things I learn every week yes. in doing these podcasts. I mean, it's just astonishing. And so, um, so amen to that. And so let's talk about LinkedIn which we've been talking about with you as an influencer as a marketing platform. And so since you run a social media marketing platform company or the CMO there, uh, are companies under or over investing in LinkedIn in your view, especially if they have a B2B type perspective? I, the answer is going to, it's going to sound counterintuitive. The answer is they're under investing. And many of you right now are saying, how about, how can you say that they're under investing when almost every single sales rep I know is on LinkedIn? Hence my statement, it's going to seem counterintuitive. They're under investing because if you're simply using LinkedIn for the navigator capabilities or just to kind of go and connect with a bunch of people, you think could be your target audience and your connection request says, hi, I'm Daryl. Can we meet for coffee for 10 minutes where I pitch slap you with my, with my features and solutions? That's not using LinkedIn. I might as well just pick up a phone book and start dialing random strangers and making a similar pitch and I'll have the exact same conversion rate, just so you know, all right? So when I say they're underinvesting, it goes back to the conversation we we're having about creators or, and or influencers. You heard Bill just say, I consider myself a creator. He considered me a bit of an influencer and there's, there's, that, there's that overlap. I go back to when I started getting serious about LinkedIn, probably around 2017, 2018. What was the catalyst for me to get serious about it? The catalyst was real straightforward. It was my two biggest competitors had both raised a couple hundred million dollars and I'd raised nothing. And they could outspend me like you mm. wouldn't believe. But by me making great content and reaching out to all the influencers or the people, the trainers, the authors, the public speakers on LinkedIn and making great content, LinkedIn Live, articles, carousels, whatever it might be, I was able to outflank them at negligible costs, negligible costs. And that's what companies aren't doing. Companies are not doing, still to this day, uh, I had, I've had more executives say to me the following, I wish I was making this up, but this will, I, I think Bill, you'll truly get this one. The reason you do what you do on LinkedIn, Daryl, is because you like that. So the implication there is, if you didn't like it, you wouldn't do it. Or said another way, I don't like it, so I'm not going to do it even though you, Daryl, are doing it because I am I'm insecure or I don't want to be visible or I don't have the time or I don't want my face out there or whatever it might be. That's the problem. We have gone from people buying from companies to people truly buying from people. The number one lead source, whether it was 1930, 1940, 1950, 1960, 1970, 1980, 1990, 2000, 2010, 2020, word of mouth. Yep. And what's changed is instead of it being us meeting in the public square or me reading it in the local newspaper, it's now me connecting with my tribe and my peers in community. That could be on LinkedIn. That could be in dedicated communities like Pavilion or Rev Genius, or Peak Marketing, the list goes on. It, it, that's where people get that word of mouth referral. So you need to make content. You need to become a creator. You need to have great conversations. You need to add value. You need to stop pitch slapping me with your features. You need to understand your ICP and your personas. And you need to just be genuine in you and engaged. Candidly, you need to be everything my wife tells me I suck at. That's what you need to be. Oh my gosh. I have never heard the phrase pitch slap, but it is now 
in my vocabulary. That is awesome. What a great one. I, I can't imagine a better, better place to wrap up than what's such a great phrase, which is uh, which should be used anywhere and everywhere because it is so true and so not the way people make, uh, make a buying decision. Um, well, Daryl, I want to turn it over to you. Any last words that you'd like to share with the community? No. I mean, we've had an honest conversation here today, folks. If you like what you heard, you know, check out everything that check out Bill. Like you should be following Bill right now if you're not. Okay. That's number one. Follow me if you thought I was mildly entertaining or nominally educational. You can always block me or mute me later on if you don't like what I have to say. But the only advice I have to you is what I've done is not secret. What Bill's doing, not secret. It's just making time, making it a priority. You understand that's how buyers buy. That's how you network. That's how you get your next job. True story. I was one of almost 30 candidates for this job I learned after the fact. One of the reasons I got the job was because they were looking for somebody, check this out, who understood social media, not because they were a social media company, which is coincidental and ironic, but because they themselves as a company needed more awareness and more reach with the community. So they connected with me, they hired me because they determined that was a skill I could bring on top of my marketing skills to help the other organization. It's the same for you folks. If there's two, if you and another candidate are a finalist for a job, who's going to get the job? And by the way, the tip here is it goes back to my analogy about which website are you going to buy the shoes from? The person who looks most credible, most engaging, has the most commentary, has shared the most knowledge, they're the ones who are going to get the job. They're the ones who are going to be found by recruiters. So you don't need to do this for your job. You don't need to do this for your company. Do this for yourself. That's my advice. I love it. Well, this has been amazing. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in to another episode of Generation Influence. Daryl, thank you so much. It has been a ton of fun, and I've learned a bunch, as I said. Thanks, everybody. Hey, thanks for tuning in. New episodes of Generation Influence drop every Wednesday, so be sure to check us out and subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts. You can find information on next week's guest, in the description below. Hope to see you then and there.